So the WebEx event center that we are using uh, has a chat feature and a questions and answer feature. Uh, please don't use the chat feature uh, unless you want to sabotage the webinar because what the chat does is popping up messages on top of my screen and if I start reading them I basically risk losing my uh, train of thought. So uh, on the other hand, if you use uh, the questions and answer panel, um, I can see there is a question and I can answer it uh, whenever um, I, I see it possible. Uh, when you connect uh, initially, uh, the system automatically uh, mutes your microphones. And I believe you can unmute them yourself or let me uh, unmute them when you want to ask an oral question. You can again use the question and answer feature to um, just raise your hand and say I want to ask an oral question. Um, please do ask questions uh, because this will make uh, the webinar more interactive and less awkward for me. Uh, currently I'm talking to my laptop screen about Effectopedia and to tell you frankly, uh, this laptop might be bored at this point because I use it for the programming um, of the Effectopedia itself, so I think it's fed up with this. So um, your feedback will be very helpful in, to summarize and um, others might have the same questions. So. Um, please uh, do interrupt me, and um, and I will be able to um, answer your question. So there is already one question, which is, do we start it yet? Yes, uh, we did start, and I hope uh, most of you can hear me well. Um, and uh, the fourth thing that I want to mention is that um, when you start up the WebEx uh, interface, uh, you can see that there is a diagonal error on the right top corner of the Effectopedia screen. And if you want to maximize the Effectopedia screen, um, you can click it and it will go full screen. And if you click Escape, it will go back to the normal size. Um, Lastly, the webinar will be recorded, um, and the idea is to be able to provide it for the people who weren't able to join us today, um, and maybe for some of you that want to uh, listen at uh, specific segments or uh, just use it. Um, and before I start, I want to mention one more thing. Um, across the two sessions of the webinar, we had more than 180 uh, participation requests. Uh, and uh, the interesting part is that um, they, uh, all of you actually have a very amazing mixture of affiliations and backgrounds. Um, just to mention a few from the industry, for example, we have representatives of pharmaceutical, chemical, energy sector, um, RC developers, um, and in the same time, uh, from non-profit world, for example, we have animal rights groups and other non-profit organizations. We have also consultants, people from academia, from students to professors, uh, governmental agencies, international organizations, and so forth. So, um, this is really what we hope for um, from the very beginning because this is a long-term open source project and we really need this type of diverse community to support the development and um, flourishment of the, pro uh, of the project. And hopefully this will allow Effectopedia to become a, basically a, some sort of neutral po portal uh, where the science can be developed and subsequently used for various applications. Um, so with that, I will um, actually start with the presentation. Hopefully, those are all the housekeeping items and you can hear me well. Um, um, so uh, 
the first thing I want to cover is uh, the idea of uh, where adverse outcome pathway stays in this uh, really evolutionary um, concept def uh, definition, because in the beginning there were the idea about, about toxicity pathways that were covering everything that happens from molecular level to uh, cellular level effects, and then they were extended uh, to mode of action, which uh, again covers uh, uh, the chain of events that happen from molecular uh, level to uh, maybe uh, organ or individual level effects. Um, and adverse outcome pathways uh, is covering more or less the same region um, of uh, effects, but maybe going to the population level and also maybe advanced a little bit in terms of uh, how we uh, capture the exposure. And there is also something uh, additional about the adverse outcome pathways that maybe uh, is changed during the um, years of definition, and that's actually, it consists of steps that are representing um, irreversible changes, not irreversible, but changes in the biological systems that could be observed, and also um, those changes are uh, things that uh, are overcoming uh, the all the biological feedback, so they happen only when we, we actually uh, see all the biological normal system are not functioning. And lastly, we have the source to outcome pathway, which covers everything from uh, putting the chemical into the environment and then uh, chemical finding its way to the individual and uh, uh, penetrating and doing everything else to go to the the normal exposure road, and since Effectopedia more or less will have to implement a uh, very similar uh, features to, to collect all of this information, we intend to actually <coughs> expand Effectopedia in the future to cover um, the full source to outcome pathway concept. And another um, terminology slide, uh, which hopefully will clear some of the confusions because we use a lot of the terms very interchangeably in the field and uh, as soon as you realize what we're talking about, it's it's okay to actually use them interchangeably, but uh, at the beginning it might be a little bit confusing. So um, very uh, basically there is a two levels of uh, representing chemical structures. Uh, very much like in Euclid. So we have uh, structure, which is more the abstract notion of the uh, chemical. It, it is associated with the smiles uh, or inch code and uh, graphical representation, IUPAC name and so forth. And then we have the substance, which is the physical um, entity. So it could have its purity parameters, uh, the source and everything that's associated with the physical uh, substance. Uh, similarly, we have uh, the notion of biological effect, which is very general because we want to be able to cover things that are outside of uh, pathways themselves. So they could be just two observable biological effects connected, and that's all the contributions a person want to make to the system. So there should be a way to, to enter it. And when we follow uh, the OECD handbook guidance and um, just the terminology used there, uh, we have key event, uh, which is basically something that stays in between the molecular initiating event and the adverse outcome, path, uh, adverse outcome, and it's also essential step of this pathway. So it's something that has to happen in order for the whole change to, to progress. And um, also, we have various types of links um, in Effectopedia, uh, so we can represent uh, some of the penetration and, uh, uh, the, let's say, uh, the first steps before the pathway that will be substance to substance uh, uh, links, and we can also uh, represent the first thing that is substance to molecular initiating event. Uh, Link, but the most common ones will be the ones that connect to uh, biological effects. And this again into more strict uh, terminology when we talk about just a single pathway. Um, 
is going to be called key event relationship just to be in line with the uh, terminology used in the uh, handbook and the OECD guidance. Um, so what are uh, theoretical building blocks of the um, any pathway. So we think there are um, basically three elements, uh, cause, uh, link, and effect. And we can build a pathway just by using those blocks, and this will represent the logic of the process uh, that is occurring. Again, those uh, uh, boxes um, are things that uh, represent uh, e events uh, that uh, are after the normal feedbacks and uh, the logical organization is overcome. So uh, those are the things that are observable, so to speak, in a little bit more stable way. But what Effectivepedia does differently is try to actually introduce the visual way of representing the biological context of the pathway. So besides the, the sequence of events, uh, we also have this um, chart uh, type of uh, spacing uh, in here. So in this example, we will have on the vertical axis, for example, uh, the effect, uh, the duration of the effect in, in terms. So you can see that the cause A is something that's uh, on a cellular level, if you look at the Higgs axis, and um, it's a short-term um, event, and then it links to um, short-term event um, that's um, actually on tissue level, the effect B. And effect B, uh, we can see that if we wait a little bit longer, uh, goes to effect C, and this is effect on a tissue level. So you can imagine that by uh, having such a spatial distribution of effects, you can uh, think of the pathway uh, through different perspectives, and we indeed can define multiple axes uh, where we can project this uh, biological context information. Um, again, uh, those uh, different axes are user expandable, so once you work on your uh, project and you find something that's really uh, important to distinguish, uh, you can add it as an axis and basically uh, break the pathway in this point. Um, I would like to show you uh, how this actually looks like in effective media so it doesn't go all theoretical. Um, so if I just uh, follow the pathway and I will go back and explain a little bit more about about the effect PD interface, but for now I will just show you how to switch the pathway space. So uh, currently I have loaded a pathway that actually displays what happens with uh, um, ionizing uncouplers. Uh, they basically interact with the mitochondrial uh, membrane and in general by reduced ATP formation lead to population reduction. So if you look at this pathway, the way it's projected currently, um, the x-axis is molecular, uh, it's a level of biological organization. So we have the things progress from molecular, organelle, cellular, and so forth to the population level. And on vertical axis, we have uh, sex. Uh, so we can see that uh, for all of the events, they actually happen for both male and female. And if I switch the, the space now to time to effect in terms, you can suddenly see the same pathway projected in a, in a different way. And Effectopedia does this projection automatically based on the biological context of each boxes. So now you can see that the um, short-term effect uh, are up to the reduced ATP-dependent functions, and then we can see that um, if we wait a little bit longer, we will see increased metabolism in organs, and we, if we wait even further down, we can see uh, heart muscle failure, uh, which is the most vulnerable organ since uh, it apparently consumes a lot of ATP to contract, and this actually could lead to respiratory failure 
and then death and population reduction. So you can see that the, this pathway actually makes much more sense to be projected in, in, um, in this way. Um, so again, just to illustrate, I will load another pathway um, and it looks like a mess right now uh, because there are um, all the boxes here haven't um, have input about what their biological uh, context in terms of uh, time to effect in permeates. So all of them are in unknown section. But if I choose to go back to the sex axis, you can see that this is the original estrogen binding example that's in the system from a really long time. Um, and you can see that this pathway actually uh, splits for male and female, and we have very different chain of events happening for uh, both genders. Um, so this is again another way of using the space to illustrate what's important and specific for the pathway. Um, now, so there is a question. Um, so the question is, uh, does the last chair, chart tell you uh, anything about how long the exposure must uh, continue? and what level of exposures must be in order to um, affect to occur. Um, and yes, actually the information could be uh, what I choose uh, was uh, time to affect in terms, but in general, we can actually use more continuous axis, which is time to affect. And then, um, again, this is not defined for this particular pathway, but then <coughs> each individual box we can actually uh, specify exactly how many hours, uh, uh, minutes, or whatever the time scale of the um, effect um, we have to wait in order to observe the binding in this case. And usually most of the molecular initiating events and molecular level events are almost instantaneous. But when we go to things that are uh, really uh, downstream, and then this really makes sense. So we have things that we have to wait, like the 96 hours standard test guideline number to, to see the effect. And that's something that um, actually will be encoded in the effect a description. And you can see that um, it's over there. And again, it could make those splits depending on um, if we wait just a few hours, so we have the acute action of the uh, chemical, and then we can wait longer hours, have longer exposures, and we will see the other branches of the pathway. And there is an example like that, but um, I will continue for now. Uh, hopefully that answers the question. Um, so, um, what are the basic building blocks of a pathway? Um, usually a pathway starts with a chemical substance, uh, and this chemical substance has the normal descriptors. So we have uh, the structure, smiles, and energy code, some uh, information about the chemical identification, um, and also a set of parameters. Some are measured, physical chemical properties, others are estimated parameters, and we can have links to the source of uh, the program that was used to calculate them and so forth. Um, then the next thing, we have a link that basically connects the chemical uh, to the beginning of the interaction with the biological system. And in this link, we can provide a quality description uh, that um, explains why and what are the underlying mechanisms that we think are in play in order for this chemical to be able to interact with the biological um, entity. And the quantity part of this description is uh, usually a dose response function. It could be also some uh, generalized number like EC50, IC50, or something like that. And then um, um, this link is actually connected to the molecular initiating event, which is the first uh, in 
point of entry of interaction with the biological uh, system. And normally we'll have uh, two sections by default for description of the molecular initiating event. The first one describes what the normal biological function. Um, and the second one actually describes what is um, disrupted and how the normal function is deteriorated by this interaction. Um, we also have this biological context. So uh, the things that I have shown you so far, those are encoded explicitly in the biological context section. We have also a list of uh, references where this information is taken for, from and some other fields that I will show you <coughs> in the interface itself. So another way to start the pathway is actually using a structural alert. And structural alerts uh, can define some fragments that need to be present in the structure in order to be um, activating the molecular initiating event, or it could include uh, specific parameters like uh, uh, log KLW, lipophilicity, or uh, some other parameters that are important just to uh, uh, make this chemical available or interactable with uh, the target. Um, and then in the place of the link here, we have very uh, uh, slightly different uh, description, which might be actually a QSR model uh, that connects the structural arts with molecular initiating event. And instead of uh, just a single dose response uh, um, encoded for a specific chemical, we will have this uh, QSR model predicting basically what uh, the response will be based on the dose. Um, just briefly going to another set of possible elements that could be used uh, uh, for supporting evidences of each individual biological effect. And those uh, are called test methods. Um, and we distinguish between um, like five types of test methods currently. Um, three or four of them are um, related to lab experiments, so to speak. So we have in chemical, in vitro, uh, in vivo, and ex vivo type of experiments. And those are uh, described um, pretty much in line with uh, first the test guidelines. Uh, and then if it's a non-standard uh, uh, test, then it should maybe follow uh, the idea about non-standard test guidelines or uh, have a little bit uh, well, streamlined definition anyways. But the idea is that uh, most of this information should be importable and exportable uh, from ISATAP format. Um, the other type of evidence that we can bring is the in silico test method, which is basically a model uh, that could predict the outcomes of uh, specific assays, or it could be something that really um, models the internal linkages uh, between the biological systems and could be probed at this different points to say what we observe uh, in terms of um, the effects. And um, there is one uh, rhomboid here connected to each of those boxes, which is uh, marked like with F of X, uh, which means that this is the what we call a transformation function. And to explain this, um, that's a kind of a possible example. Uh, this function actually had to map uh, the results of the measured effect uh, to what we observed in vivo. So, um, and this is just a sample function. We actually can have a multiple steps of conversion. So we, we first we can have conversion of doses, then we can have uh, some conversions of magnitude and so forth. But the idea is that we um, follow in the pathway the logic of the in vivo system and everything that comes uh, below it uh, from a test or being in silico or in lab test uh, had to be converted to something that's comparable across the whole pathway. Uh, we also think of a possibility to basically um, 
measure everything against the standard chemical. Um, for example, for estrogen binding, this the natural binder estrogen will be a good candidate for this purpose. Uh, but again, this will become evident uh, when we develop um, a little bit more of the examples that um, we are currently working on. And I think, is there any questions I can answer? If not, I will like I would like to show you um, one of the examples that we are currently working on, and this is the. Um, estrogen binding example in fish. Um, just a second to figure it out. So this more or less is the same uh, idea about the um, estrogen binding pathway. So it follows uh, the events leading from binding to the estrogen receptor to the population reduction. Uh, but actually it shows the, beyond the, the set of uh, biological effects of the chain of events, it actually uh, shows all the available information up to now. Um, uh, what are the test uh, methods available to verify and uh, probe all of those biological effects? And you can see that there are two distinct colors here. One is the purple one, and the other is the brown one, which actually signifies different type of uh, Tests. The purple ones are in vitro tests and the brown ones are in vivo. Um, again, if I double click on one of the in vitro tests, you can see that this is uh, part of uh, this test. It's uh, parent generation adult medaca liver vitelogen um, induction, and it's part of uh, multi generational medaca investigation. Um, so, to summarize the investigation, we have a description section here which shows the timeline of uh, the whole investigation. So, we have uh, three generations, uh, and we follow the generations. Um, those here on the bottom are the weeks. So, the study week starts from the first one and goes to the almost 30th week. And we can see uh, basically what type of endpoints are measured in each individual endpoint here, uh, in each individual time uh, moment. So we have uh, several endpoints measured. Um, in this example, we actually don't use the full study. We use up to the first generation. So um, we basically have defined two studies under this investigation, and one is about the first uh, the parent generation, and the other is about the, the first offspring. Um, we have um, also for this uh, uh, test, which again was the described here as a title, the telogen and mRNA induction. We don't have populated uh, 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 this uh, information. Uh, properly, but the idea is to actually have uh, uh, um, the idea is to basically have a description about uh, what are uh, the fields of the method itself, so how the method uh, works. Uh, we can have a little bit more information about if the uh, chemical is actually within the domain of the method, and that means, for example, it has the proper, um, it doesn't uh, change the pH, for example, of the um, test uh, setup or do something that actually makes this chemical unmeasurable. Um, we also can have the time domain, so maybe we need to wait a um, specific amount of time 
before we see the effect, so we need to measure it in this specific uh, frame. Um, we can have, um, again, um, different uh, species that could be uh, tested with this method, so different type of fish in this case. Um, maybe it's relevant to different life stage and so forth. Also, we can um, bring some information about the reproducibility across the laps of this test, uh, repeatability in the lab itself, um, and some other measures of uh, quality and performance of the assay. And please don't really uh, look very carefully at the definitions of those items that they're going to change very soon because those are just rough uh, sketch ideas of what we want to collect. And then uh, we have a section that um, now will describe, for example, the throughput of the test method, um, how many animals and what species are used. Um, and maybe something that we want to introduce is um, some idea about uh, for a given location and year, how much the test costs so we can then use it maybe in IATA strategies to basically see, uh, use it just as a parameter. Um, then we have um, below here, you can see the same context box that's actually used in the um, effect description. So uh, this provides uh, a context for this box and you can see it visually maybe that it actually belongs in the same space. So it's, it, what it tells us is that we are using, in this case, something that's also on a tissue level and also in mail. So we are more or less uh, okay with uh, this assay. Otherwise, it might be a little bit more complicated to uh, define this transformation function. Um, what I also want, would like to show you is maybe another <coughs> Uh, test assay that have some um, a little bit of a, a test data embedded. So here, for example, uh, when we have the test assay description, uh, we can add a list of uh, we can update this list of tested substances. So we will have uh, this is the substance that was tested, so it will have the purity and everything else described above. Um, and then those are the actual uh, numbers measured uh, in the assay that uh, we have currently on display. And in this case, there is uh, another reference chemical um, estrogen measured in the same assay, so you can see them both. Uh, and this is pretty much customizable depending on the type of uh, measurements that you're making. It's uh, more or less the summary and the interpretation data, the most important data for um, your uh, test. And the rest of the data will be actually represented in a very similar to ISATAP format, so if they will have all the um, really details about the samples and so forth. So um, further down, I, I don't think I mentioned before that we also have a, a list of labs that are actually uh, capable of uh, measuring this, uh, performing this test. And also here in the tested substances description, we will have a reference to the lab where it was uh, actually made. So. This is uh, additional information when we, for example, have multiple labs measuring one and the same substance using the same test that uh, we can compare the results and think why they might be a differences and so forth. So um, also keep in mind that eventually those will be able, you will be able to compare the results between different tests as well after they are transformed by the transformation function. So um, maybe I will go back to the presentation if there is no questions currently. Um, and again, I just want to bring your attention to one hypothetical pathway and what, um, 
what I want to focus now is that uh, the link between the chemical substance and the molecular initiated event um, has those two possibilities to be hypothetical link or those response link. Um, and when we go further down on the pathway, this, uh, the link actually can be slightly different. Um, so it could be again hypothetical, so we just think that this link exists, uh, could be direct. So we know whenever molecular initiating event occurs, the, first, the next biological effect always occur and the relation is one to one. So it's 100% of the first one leads to the 100% of the, the following one. We can also have uh, cases where we need to define threshold. So if, uh, for example, with the ATP uh, depletion, um, if we have uh, above some certain percent depletion, uh, then we will have one effect. If we have above another threshold, we might have a different effect. So this is, again, some uh, way of splitting the pathways according to the thresholds. And we can encode them into the different links. And finally, we have response-response curves, which are basically could be derived based on the um, test available test methods on both sides of the uh, link. And ideally, those uh, test methods should be included in a, a single study. So uh, they are basically uh, considered for the same chemical, same exposure regime, and things that uh, actually makes those results comparable, and we can calculate um, the link itself. So um, maybe I will show you another example now just to bring your attention to a little bit different uh, type of uh, tests that we can use. Um, so this is uh, aromatase inhibition. Uh, leading again to uh, population uh, reduction. And in this case, we actually have a fairly linear uh, pathway. Uh, but what's interesting is that we intend to include here, for example, for this aromatase inhibition, we intend to include very different type of uh, uh, test methods. Uh, so one uh, is uh, taken from uh, TOXCAST uh, assay, so it's a high throughput testing method. Uh, the others are low throughput uh, uh, in, in vivo models. And the last one, which is currently with just, uh, uh, I mean, our in house name, we will probably name it properly, but this is the name of the developer of the uh, in silico model. So uh, we will have all four of them compared and producing basically the same result. So it will be interesting, I believe, to see how uh, we can interpret data from uh, various uh, sources of information. And just to be able to um, explain why we need to pay attention to uh, well, when we use this uh, transformation box is basically uh, we have to step back a little bit and think that um, the pathway as it's defined actually starts with the chemical already in the target site and acting with uh, um, our molecular target. Um, but this is the quantity, exact quantity of the chemical that we think it will be. And, uh, but from, in reality, we know that this actually uh, chemical um, is uh, exposing the animal. So if we have here uh, some sort of the reverse level of biological organization axis, you can see that on the individual level, the chemical actually interacts with the individual and depending on the exposure route, it starts propagating to the different organs and it's distributed across the different tissues. 
and then maybe we have a step of metabolism in certain tissue so it could produce uh, different metabolites and some of those metabolites can actually interact uh, again with our molecular target but some might trigger completely other uh, pathway um, and what we currently uh, can um, represent in Effectopedia is uh, the one uh, part of the picture that's represented in solid line. So we can actually show how the tested chemical, uh, given some enzymatic environment, uh, can be metabolized to another chemical. And we intend uh, to, we actually, one of the examples that we're working on um, probably will help us to see how we are going to represent those uh, penetration pharmacokinetic models so we will be able to um, eventually describe those, those steps as well. So in summary about the, how the, the, the system works in general, um, I hope uh, you kind of uh, start to get a feeling uh, that there is a multiple layers of representation of the information. So the topmost level is really a visual representation. And if we zoom a little bit, uh, we can see that uh, we try to put as much information in this visual encoding as possible. For example, in this case, we see the chemical that's interacting with the uh, receptor and we can see that in, in this case this link has a slightly different shape showing that we have a dose response information uh, versus the upper one where we just have a hypothetical link. <coughs> also we have um, here on this picture we have in vitro test method so we can see what are the evidences of the pathway that we currently have. And this really helps when you see the whole pathway and you will know exactly uh, what is the available information and what maybe needs to be further analyzed and added to the pathway. And then we, when we double click on the link, for example, we will be able to see this additional layer of information representing the information about the link itself. And on the Left hand side, we have the chemical that's causing the, uh, uh, in this case, binding. And on the right hand side, we have the molecule initiating event. If we dig further down, uh, we will be able to show another layer of information, which may be capturing the, the raw data of the experiment, or at least summary of it. And we also could have uh, source code of the in silico model that are used, or we can have simulated versions of them. So before I go to the um, comparison with Wiki, AOP, Wiki, and so forth, I would like to show you a little bit of uh, effect PDA system itself. Uh, so I will use uh, maybe start from the beginning. So when you load Effectopedia, what you first see is this welcome screen. And on the top, um, the system says that it's actually connected to Effectopedia.org server, and it sees the revision five of the database. Um, and this revision five, uh, you can go back in time by using this arrow or see previous revisions of the database. And what you can do is uh, currently there is a, I mean, our approach was to try to simplify the entrance to the interface, but we definitely will look uh, for ways to uh, fine tune this uh, interface to different usage scenarios. But what you can see initially is actually you can search uh, information about individual chemicals. Um, you can also look at uh, adverse outcome pathways that are existing, and uh, you can create a new pathway, view the current activities on the pathway development, and provide feedback for effectively itself. Uh, additionally, what you can see when I move my cursor here, on the lower panel, there is a 
context sensitive help which uh, basically explains uh, what this uh, particular link does and it's uh, sensitive to the location um, of my location in the screen so when I click uh, in the second link which is the review uh, of the current state status of existing adverse outcome pathways uh, um, currently because I already used uh, the program you can see some results but normally this is empty so you can see that um, you can list all the existing uh, pathways in the system or you can search them by name so um, if I just search by ER, which is ER receptor, you can see there are two results. Um, and what you search uh, for is basically defined first by the data source where you are searching it. Then you can select what you are searching. For example, if I choose to search uh, um, just biological effects and then click list, uh, you can see that there are 373 um, biological effects defined in Effectopedia. Um, and there is a question now, so I will try to answer this uh, before I continue. Uh, so the question is, uh, could you further elaborate on how this tool will uh, capture, uh, repair pathways, thereby removing one uh, um, potential uh, critical pathway. Um, let me, I, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. I will read it once more for myself. So, uh, so I, I think uh, what I made of the question is um, if we have multiple pathways uh, we can actually um, show them and explore them together so um, and we can I will show you uh, just one example I guess um, so um, what I did was I'm looking for a chemical or a case study um, you know, if I list all the chemicals, um, I can see the amoaniline is one of the chemicals associated with two pathways. Uh, here, the first one is estrogen binding, and the second one is uh, um, oxidation of chemoglobin, uh, lead it again to uh, population reduction. So if I want to see what the interaction of those two pathways is um, actually is I can load both of the pathways simultaneously by clicking on this pathways link and then probably choose a proper dimension and then you can see that um, I can load those two pathways in the FTPD interface simultaneously so we have um, Anoaniline binding to the estrogen receptor uh, leading to population reduction, which was the ER pathway. And we have another pathway, which is amoaniline uh, leading to oxidation of met uh, hemoglobin, which uh, does oxidative stress in different uh, number of steps that again leads to population reduction. So um, basically what you can do is do absolutely the same for various types of for each of those boxes not only for the chemical so if we have a chemical we can make something that very much resembles the old case studies we have the chemical and everything that is known this chemical to cause uh, listed in one screen and another interesting aspect of this is that if uh, we have the doses defined here for the amoaniline, and if um, this effect actually happens at very distinct uh, dose uh, range, uh, we will know those pathways are going to be more or less um, independent from each other. So we, when we measure in vivo effect, we will be able to say that yes, this in vivo effect actually, because from all we know, uh, those 
pathways actually operate in different exposure regimes. So uh, we know that what we are observing is actually because of the uh, this pathway and not because of the other one. But when we have very similar exposure ranges, then it becomes evident that both pathways are actually um, uh, operating at the same level of the toxic. And so we, when we are looking at the in vivo studies, we might not be able to distinguish well between them. And we maybe need to make uh, extra uh, verifications on things that actually tell us uh, if those two pathways are actually followed. And I guess I, I will show you just one more thing uh, in, in this respect. Uh, so if I choose to search for a, a, uh, one very popular uh, biological effect, unfortunately, death, um, and if I load um, the pathways that are associated with it, it is going to load a lot of pathways that uh, lead to this effect. Uh, and the interesting part is when I go to the effect itself and double click on it, you can see basically um, on the right hand side, on the left hand side, you can see all possible ways that are known in Effectopedia that cause death. Uh, so we can have seizures, convulsions, paralysis, uh, and so forth. And you can explore those uh, individually. So if I basically click on the paralysis, the system follows uh, this pathway that's associated with the uh, paralysis. So I can go up and down stream. If I choose to click on the link, I can, I can see what's the link description. And to go back to the effects, I can just double click on the title. So the idea is basically to be able to uh, trace alongside the network of pathways uh, uh, by using those navigation tools. So uh, just to make it clear again, uh, the list of uh, causes here is not just uh, for the currently displayed pathways. This is the list of everything that's known in Effectopedia to be connected to this biological effect. And I believe this provides a lot of uh, useful information for scientists that uh, they can see uh, that uh, this information is actually, I mean, probably some of this information is contributed from somebody else and they will be able to maybe learn something and think about the pathway in a different way. So uh, now I'm going back to the questions. Um, so the, the second question I see, for example, if uh, MIE is interaction with DNA, uh, how uh, DNA repair mechanisms will be taken into account? And the idea of the pathway in this case is basically we, we have to define the MIE as a, something that actually goes after all the repair mechanisms are done and they could not anymore repair um, uh, DNA properly. So we can observe a certain percent, I don't know if it's not the right word percent, but certain damage in DMA, uh, DNA. So it may be just yes or no, or the percent of the cells that are actually damaged. Um, but yes, the MIE in this case should represent basically what happens after all the repair mechanisms are taken into account and broken. And maybe in the future we will actually be able to hook uh, those system biology models that explain the, the feedback loops uh, mechanisms in which normally the function, uh, normally the biological system functions. But uh, in any ways, we would like to um, actually see what actually happens when the system doesn't function properly. And this is what the pathway follows. Uh, when something stops to function, what are the effects after uh, this on the next level of biological organization. 
So we have another question. What are the hypothetical limits based on? Um, is there evidence behind these uh, when you click on them? Uh, so when we have a hypothetical link, it could be some correlative uh, statistical study, for example, and you can um, definitely supply this information in the link description itself. So if I go to one link, uh, you basically have very uh, similar structure of the description, so you can have multiple description sections uh, um, and references to the literature. So if you have uh, known some empirical evidences or something else that uh, says that this hypothetical link is actually might exist, uh, then you can provide this information here. Um, but in this case, you don't actually have actual dose response measured, so you don't provide them and you don't claim anything more than you, you know. Um, so there is another question. Um, is new data that someone adds to affected video always stored uh, on a server um, and not locally? Uh, can data be um, set to private uh, sandbox? Uh, so the question is, can we work uh, pathways basically with uh, private and public data? And uh, yeah, I really thank you for this question because this is one of the advantages of Effectopedia because it actually can mix uh, multiple sources. So in this case, uh, I mean, you have two options. You can work from a local file, which you can exchange internally in your organization, and that's what we are currently doing. The examples that I'm showing you, um, which we work with different groups, we exchange the files themselves, and you don't see them into the public space. And once we decide that the examples are more or less ready to be seen from the world, we can just, with one click, publish them. Um, the same idea uh, could work in a, a little bit more elaborate uh, manner. So if you want to install a separate server in your organization, uh, you can basically see here, I have being connected to Effectopedia server, but here this is the basically a list of things that you can be connected to. So you can imagine that your server will be here as well, and you will be able to use things that are just uh, available on your intranet. And uh, the power of Effectopedia is that actually you can mix this with the public knowledge. So internally in your company, you will see um, both the internal and the external uh, system. And again, the additional advantage is that you're already uh, working in, in, in the same standard. So if you decide to publish your data, you will be able to do so by just uh, clicking on the publish button. And you can selectively publish just the sum of the information, not all of it. Um, so uh, I, I will just... I would like to show you how hopefully easy it is to actually create a new pathway. Um, the, the biggest problem with creating a pathway is not the visual interface or something, it's actually the knowledge that you need to have. So it's uh, really, uh, hopefully the system is uh, flexible enough to allow you to create a pathway uh, relatively quickly um, and um, effortless. And again, the biggest problem is actually, so you decide uh, each of those elements of the pathway, where to put them. For example, do you observe it at a specific cellular level or tissue level? So those are tough questions. Otherwise, it's easy to draw it. Um, I can show you, for example, if I start a pathway with the tool that's uh, Pretty much if we think we have a very linear pathway, I can use this wizard and basically put my first chemical here in, uh, I put it in the male molecular level and then go all the way to uh, population level effect. And if I click again, um, the whole chain of uh, 
um, events actually is created. So if I go and select to delete the ones that I don't know, uh, for example, we don't have anything on server level and on individual level, let's say, the, this is what the pathway remains to look like. Uh, so we can then start populating it and do other things with it. Another way to start a pathway, uh, I guess I will start a new one, is to use this uh, so-called select tool. Um, it actually substitutes uh, all the four tools in front of it uh, in just one tool and makes it a little bit easier to make branched pathways. So again, I start this time on mixed molecular level with a chemical and I can put um, uh, link and then molecular initiating event. What you also additionally can do if you click on any of those elements, uh, basically it rotates uh, the type of element that is connected. So when I click once, it says active metabolite, uh, structural alert, uh, biological perturbation, and chemical. And the same will be valid for the molecular initiating event. Um, so let's say I want to continue this pathway and just go to something on a cellular level, then let's say the pathway branches here and we have something similar to uh, estrogen pathway. So we have uh, the pathway splits between uh, male and female, but uh, yeah, let's just draw it like that just to show that there is, there is a split. Um, and once you're ready with more or less the topology of the pathway, uh, maybe I can add a little bit of a test assays uh, here and there. So I can add one here. And again, I can rotate the type of the assay with clicking over it. Um, so what we have defined so far is uh, maybe uh, how the, the pathway looks like in, in terms of topology. But when we try to define each of those boxes, uh, uh, I, when I double click on one of those boxes, um, you can see that there is a list, in this case, just one element of things that already exist in Effectopedia exactly in the same context. So they are in male tissue level effects. And here I will have the list of all existing elements. So what system does is basically prevent us to make the duplications. Uh, so if something is already defined, uh, it will be shown here in the list. And this is also a place where we will interact with the uh, AOP wiki. So if something is available on AOP wiki, it should be shown either in this list on, or in a separate list. So you, you will be aware at least that this information is already encoded in <coughs> AOP wiki. But uh, in any case, if I choose to use the selected, um, you can see that this element changes to the uh, chosen element, so I don't need to re-enter any of the information uh, that was initially described. And the same goes for the uh, test assays. Uh, so if I click, um, basically the system checks if there is anything defined as a in chemical tests uh, method in this uh, vicinity of the space, and if it doesn't, it directly shows me the interface to create a new one. If it was available, then it will ask me what uh, if uh, I want to uh, select from existing one. So um, maybe um, at this point, uh, I would like to um, go to the question about interaction between Effectopedia and uh, AOP Wiki. Um, I have to say that Effectopedia actually started a really long time ago, uh, like 2006, and uh, it was a project that was uh, really designed to be uh, 
capturing and making everything possible into the same system. So, uh, but because it was really uh, challenging and brave uh, open source project, it took a long years to, to get to the point where we have uh, some system that is implemented. And meanwhile, the community of users actually needed some system where they can place their AOP knowledge. So to fill this gap, actually AOP Wiki uh, was established and it's a very easy to use tool, I think, to uh, describe um, adverse outcome pathways. Um, but it will have some limitations related to the wiki technology itself. So it's a, more of a text description tool, so it doesn't have the ability to upload the data, run models, and do other things that you can do in Effectipedia. But our hope is basically to uh, connect both systems through the what we call um, AOP Knowledge Base Hub and make sure that users enter the information in one of the systems and we will make sure that the other system is somehow aware of it or uh, in best case scenario it's actually usable in the other system as well so if i open for example uh, one of the pathways that uh, that dan has dan Vilnius actually has created in uh, aop wiki um, already and we are currently working on Effectopedia version of this pathway. This is a Ramotase inhibition example. Um, you can see that if I go here, currently the Ramotase inhibition information is empty. So what uh, currently have been done um, is in these simple cases where we have uh, uh, one and the same map folder of the both pages, uh, we can actually go to AOP Wiki, uh, maybe pick the aromatase inhibition pathway, and in a second, hope it will load. Um, then when we go to the description of the aromatase inhibition molecular initiating event, which corresponds exactly to what we have open currently in Effectopedia, you can see there are, are a little bit of uh, description sections, as we call them in Effectopedia, defined already in the wiki. So what we can do is just uh, select them, copy, and go to Effectopedia and paste them. And you can see that they are actually pasted as a separate description sections. Um, maybe it doesn't really make uh, sense to copy and paste all of them, uh, and that needs a little bit of further editing. For example, the, the evidence sections actually talks about uh, a little bit of how the effect could be measured. And here in Effectopedia, we have a separate interface that actually lists all the available tests that we are using. So you can see, for example, the test itself. And if I double click here, it will load the test description. So it's a little bit more um, parsed out information and it's uh, belonging to a different blocks in Effectopedia. But more or less, if we are able to connect both uh, systems, this information should be possible to transfer for, from one system to another. And in the same way, uh, just to continue the example, if I go to the references, um, I can as well copy them uh, in pretty much similar manner. So if I copy and go here and paste them at the bottom, you can see the list of references now here. So. Hopefully this will be um, not very discouraging for people to transfer the information from manually for now from one system to another, but um, we have to do, I mean, what is one of the uh, hurdles of this is uh, 
maybe the licensing of the information. So let's say in the AOP wiki, the information is published under Creative Commons license, and in effect, PD as well is Creative Commons license, but maybe you have to bring the list of authors that is, is the original uh, list of authors in one of the systems actually to be list of authors here in Effectipedia 2. So there are some technical things and maybe some information technology things that we have to um, struggle through and work out. But uh, in general, the, the transfer of information between the both systems should be um, defined pretty well in the future. Um, since I mentioned the authors list, um, I can show you here that uh, Effectipedia basically does this uh, author collection automatically. Uh, so whenever you actually type something or change something, you are automatically added to the list of authors. Um, and what I will demonstrate this with is, um, let me pull not this one, but this one. So let's say you have a URL to, uh, and this is a permanent link to, uh, sorry, that's what we can show. Uh, so you have a permanent link uh, to a work that you have published in Effectopedia, and this is a specific revision of your pathway and it has the normal like author's year of publishing. And you can use this URL to always point to your original contribution. So if I go here at the top line where the address is and just paste the link, you can see that the system actually opens the pathway in the form and shape it was originally added to the system. So you can always actually rely on having uh, your version of the pathway citable and you can actually uh, rely on that nobody else was modifying the things that you actually contributed originally. Uh, but this doesn't mean that this pathway didn't evolve. I mean, it could actually have uh, multiple revisions after yours, but that actually helps to distinguish between the uh, one of the revisions and the other. So if I click I was going to show you, for example, currently I'm not logged in. So I'm basically logged in as a guest. So if I decide to make changes, if you look closely, this is the original list of contributors. And if I actually background change the background to background one, I'm immediately added as a guest contributor. And if I publish this, uh, it will become a part of the list of contributors. And what we think is that this list actually has to be a little bit better managed, not just alphabetically, but maybe um, provide different weights to the people who contributed uh, differently to the to the knowledge. Um, and what else I was going to show you is. Um, Maybe, um, again, this whole idea and spirit of uh, architecture of participation, which was originated uh, in Effectopedia following by the standard media wiki uh, approach. So let's imagine that we have uh, uh, sorry for the pun, but uh, a PhD student who actually has run uh, several classes over and over again. Uh, he or she knows a lot of details about those. Uh, he or she can actually publish this information into the Effectopedia. And you can see after the publishing is done, the revision number is increased to two. So the Effectopedia is changed now. Um, on the other hand, if we have uh, some another expert that knows uh, a lot about specific chemical and maybe we'll be able to contribute uh, the knowledge up to different endpoints, but not to, for example, adverse outcome that some other expert knows. So 
once this second expert actually adds this piece of the puzzle, the orange one, uh, to affect PDF, the system actually triggers that uh, um, you are connecting your knowledge to existing knowledge, and this actually creates an automatic notification to the first original author, so um, he or she now knows that somebody has uh, use their knowledge and modify it or connect it to it, and they can establish uh, uh, some scientific exchange and work a little bit more focused on their uh, mutual interest. Uh, similarly, if we have uh, uh, organization, uh, I don't know if this is visible well, but if we have uh, some organization like EPA or ECD uh, that wants to systematically cover different areas of toxicology, uh, then uh, what they can do is announce uh, challenges and then people from various parts of the world can actually start building those pathways and further down they actually can propose the new pathways to uh, be uh, to go through this uh, formal review process. And uh, when the organization uh, thinks that these pathways actually meet a specific set of criteria that are established exactly <coughs> through this organization, they actually can provide their own seal of approvals uh, for this pathway. And this pathway, this seal of approvals are actually added to um, just this version of the pathway that was reviewed. So this revision number really helps in this respect. So if the pathway is changed further down on the road, um, the seal of approval is actually associated with the specific revision. And an organization that was providing the seal of approval can actually revise uh, further down on the road if they want to reapprove the new version of the pathway or not. Um, we can also use Effectopedia, uh, I mean, governments can use it, uh, maybe for a lot more than those uh, listed purposes for uh, prioritization of testing, for informing uh, hazard identification, um, maybe uh, in, uh, regulatory risk assessment and many other things, because we have this information about uh, basically everything that's known in, in a hopefully very transparent and very logical well, way described in just uh, one concise concept. So they will be able to make a lot more informed decisions. And lastly, we can have, uh, for example, industry, which actually, as I already mentioned, can mix their private data with public data, and eventually they can publish their private pathways as soon as they think they need a regulatory approval, so um, basically interact with governments and um, international organizations. And um, it is really not necessary those to be so uh, compartmentalized, so we can have one expert actually working as a different in different ways in the same system. So if it's uh, trying to establish a regulatory perspective, then he can interact with the system in one way. If it's just accumulating all the knowledge that's available, uh, it could act in a different way. So um, that's almost all that I have uh, in thought to cover, and I'm almost until the toward the end of my presentation, I just wanted to maybe uh, just talk a little bit about uh, this discussion uh, element that I mentioned and this interaction and notification element that I mentioned in the um, cartoon. So if we have a pathway, and if I click on some of the biological effects described in there, in this case, molecular initiating event, we actually have which each of those elements we have associated uh, discussion section and chat section. Uh, we, we currently have uh, the discussion section more established. So, for example, if you are not agreeing with the formulation of this title, you can actually 
right to original contributor, I think that this should be named this and this uh, and provide your reasoning why you think this should be the case. And this is going to be very useful when we have uh, cases uh, when, for example, we have two camps of thought and one camp is actually modifying the pathway in a certain way and the other camp is actually modifying it back to a, a different way. And exactly like uh, it is done in uh, standard Wikipedia, this pathway um, or this specific element could be frozen for editing and uh, those two groups actually are basically forced to make uh, use of the discussion and decide which portion of the pathway um, they want to have publicly available and visible. And hopefully this arbitration mechanism will um, help have a unique version of the pathway uh, in the public space. But um, this actually doesn't really prevent them from putting, uh, if we have, for example, multiple test results and they might be contradictory, we can actually load them all in effectively and show them into the same space. And uh, this hopefully will help scientists actually uh, start uh, figuring out why those results might be different. Uh, is there anything specific about the assays, the way they were executed? Or, um, I mean, it, it's really useful tool to make those hypotheses why we uh, might have differences. And to finish and summarize, I would like to um, hopefully leave you with these messages. Effectopedia. Um, is designed to be a, a visual tool that actually captures semantic information um, and try to organize it in a specific reusable component. Um, it could maintain uh, version controlled versions of the AOPs uh, and also uh, provides uh, all the relevant information that you might need to judge the quality of this pathway, so um, your experimental evidences as well as description of your models. Um, another thing that we uh, hope to achieve is that this system is always ready for uh, review and collaboration, so when you see the pathway publicly um, and the signs already have changed, you can actually contact the original um, uh, developer or contributor and start engaging uh, uh, with a new incarnation of the pathway. And this is something that uh, maybe is a little bit slower in terms of standard uh, publication approach where you um, have to basically write another paper, wait another amount of time. Which brings me to uh, the idea of basically building those platforms like uh, AUP Wiki and Effectopedia as electronically publishing uh, platforms. So when you have um, all the data um, encoded in the proper format and you have uh, all the information even more than that goes to a standard journal publication and if we can establish uh, <coughs> basically peer review system where you don't see, for example, the identity of uh, your reviewers, uh, but you can answer publicly the questions and if they are satisfied, uh, then this basically becomes a review paper. Uh, we hope that this might be established in the future as a standard way of publishing information. And from Informatics point of view, I, I think this makes a lot more sense because as a programmer, I actually am very confused when I see, for example, a standard uh, uh, already well-defined um, uh, data set and uh, numerical information that has to be reformatted in order to be published into a journal publication. And then years after, some other teams actually go and review those publications and try to uh, get the information and uh, load it into the databases. So we have this really enormous effort for everybody involved to 
constantly reformat the data from one really readable machine readable format to unreadable and then from unreadable to readable again, which could be really uh, hopefully easily overcome when you use a system like Effectopedia and you have everything in one place. Um, and I would like to also uh, say that uh, currently Effectopedia is available as alpha version on SourceForge. Uh, so if you go and just look for Effectopedia, um, there will be two websites at the top. Uh, first is the home of Effectopedia. You can use both of them to download Effectopedia. I will go to the second one just to show a little bit more download options. Um, so when you go here, uh, depending on the operating system that you're using, you might need a slightly different version. Um, so the most common case I will advise is to use basically Effectopedia jar file. It does require, and it's a standard thing to have your system installed with uh, Java. And if you have Java, you should be able to run it on Mac, uh, Linux, uh, Windows, uh, Unix maybe even, and uh, various uh, systems using the same file. But what can happen is when you are in um, organization that have uh, strict firewalls and uh, things that actually prevent any application for connecting to the internet, you might need a Windows installer, uh, which basically creates a, a wrap around the um, Effectopedia jar file and it installs it as a standard Windows application. This allows you to basically create a separate um, firewall exceptions for the Effectopedia executable and you don't need to, let's say, allow all Java applications to go to the internet, you can actually allow only Effectopedia to go. And currently, in the current version of Effectopedia, we have some automatic proxy detection embedded into the system, so it should be really penetrating most of the um, normal firewalls. Uh, and But uh, every system is different, so I could not guarantee this before. Uh, we experience it. So in case uh, you really have problems with uh, using the system online, you can basically download this Effectopedia uh, um, version, uh, this version of the offline database, and it actually contains everything that's available online, and it's relatively frequently updated. And if you open it, as a file, just as you open any other file, you will be able to see what everybody else sees uh, completely offline. And this was one of the goals type a few quantitative examples and uh, the examples are in very different areas. Two of them are uh, related to fish in different effects in fish, uh, but one of them is more experimentally based. The second one is more model based, so we have in silico models involved. And the third example is uh, related to skin synthesization in humans, so it's completely different species and again maybe model based, so we have various uh, types of things that we want to try the system with and eventually we will try to expand it to cover different areas afterwards so we will go to neurotoxicity to developmental and so forth so with this i would like to conclude uh, my presentation and open the floor for any additional questions that you might have and I know that we are running close to the end of time, so uh, so there is one question. Could you please elaborate more on the use of experimental data? Um, experimental data, as I said, um, should be recorded um, in a very flexible data format, uh, which uh, 
allows us to capture uh, really variety of data from uh, genomic and toxicogenomic data to set normal assay information, which you measure just one endpoint in time and uh, uh, dose dependent. Um, so hopefully we will create a system completely universal in, uh, and capable of capturing all sources information. Uh, and if we could not do this uh, internally into the system, we hopefully will provide a way of uh, referring to external systems that will host this information. So uh, hopefully this experimental data have to have uh, something that's usable in the AOP concept. So uh, we have to be able to say how much of the effect uh, or key event we are observing, of what, um, if it could be defined in terms of percentage or a low, medium, high effect or something like that. So basically your experimental data has to elaborate uh, some specific effects, but other than that, it should be um, any existing uh, test methods and models should be possible to describe in the system. So I hope that answers the question. Um, if you have any further questions. And feel, please feel free to basically download uh, Effective the application, play with it, and ask me questions directly, which may be much more related to your specific subject of interest. And with uh, some of you, actually, I will uh, hopefully get further interactions and look at uh, your specific examples. So um, look at this uh, webinar just as a very preliminary information, which uh, could help you decide if this system is useful or not. But um, hopefully, it, it could potentially be tuned to your needs uh, with time. And if there is no further question, uh, when the presentation is over, uh, there is a survey, which uh, really, uh, if you are, feel like uh, responding on those two or three questions, it will be very valuable for us as a feedback. Um, and thank you all for participation. And hopefully, uh, this was useful for you. And uh, you can um, start playing with the system and provide us some feedback. Uh, thank you.